Welcome once again to Wednesday night Bible study. Whatever night you're looking at this, I'm getting it done on Tuesday probably, so I, I get confused. I hope you're doing all right. We are in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. <clears throat> at least, Jim, that's the plan. We'll see if that happens. But uh, such good stuff here. Such really good stuff here. So um, let's dig right into it, okay? Let's begin with verse 3. And I won't go over all that last week, but you need to hear this in context. Verse 3, reading from the Christian Standard Bible. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. Now, the new, new verses. For this very reason. So you need to see what came back from last week, those two verses. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness Goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted, and has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. Then verses 10 through 11, finish it, but we won't get into it until next week. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will, richly, will be richly re provided for you. Isn't that a great passage? It's so chock full of great stuff. Now, before we begin, <clears throat> let me step away. <clears throat> if you want to uh, pause this and record and write things, if you're taking notes, some of you do, I know. But here's what I got. Let me read through it. The appeal, verses five through seven. I'll talk about effort and what the word supplement means goodness, knowledge. Beside that is the Greek word gnosis, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. I'll explain that in a minute. Self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. And at the very bottom, it says the aim, verses 8 through 9, the aim which is to live a godly life or a disciplined life. And we'll end with three things on the right. Reminder, a challenge, and a caution. All right? You got all that? I say, if you need that, go back and uh, write those down. You can pause it and write things down. Now, <clears throat> obviously what we just read is something that is so interesting. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll probably I'll probably step over myself as I'm talking. We have a list. We have a list of things that is for your life. Now, this isn't the only place. Let me let me just point out a couple of other places where something like this occurs. Let's see if I can get over there. James chapter one. He says, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever <clears throat> you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produce endurance. Let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So we have trials, endurance, full effect, which is maturity and completeness, lacking nothing. And then over in Romans, Chapter 5. See if I can get there. 
Romans chapter 5 is a little more of a list. Verse 2, well, verse 1, Therefore, since we've been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then comes the list. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that our affliction produces endurance and endurance produces character and proving character produces hope in this hope will not disappoint us. Now, each one of those, James and Romans, as I look at them and kind of think about them a little bit, each one of them talks about <clears throat> something similar. Both of them talk about problems in your life. So with James, the trials produces endurance, endurance produces maturity. Similar with Romans, you know, you have, you have problems and they're going to produce uh, patience, endurance, finally hope. And to me, what, I'm, what I see the difference between that and what we just read in Second Peter is that those are, are kind of like um, life-inspired, if you will. When you have a problem, you have a disappointment, you have a struggle, you have a trial, you have a temptation. And when you work through those with the right steps, then it produces great things. It's a little different here in Peter. Now, in 2 Peter. Now, there is a similarity in this. We know from 1 Peter, and it goes into 2 Peter, that there are struggles within the Christian life. But I don't see this as exactly the same way, at least the way that he's talking about it. I want you to notice what I have here. Look at verse 5. For this very reason, the reasons of what God has placed in your life. Remember we said last week that God has given us everything that was required for life and godliness through him who called us. He's given us precious promises. This is the divine, this is the divine sovereignty of God. What God has given to you. But then verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort, make every effort to supplement your faith. Make every effort. Let me talk there for a second about effort. It's, in, it's an interesting word. Paul uses, or Peter uses it, Several more times. Verse 10, therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort. Verse 15, I will also make every effort. And then in, as he closes out this brief letter in chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 14, therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort. So it's not something that he just said, well, I'll use this word, but... It's something that he's trying to get across to them. What is he getting across to them? <clears throat> I think this. God has a divine sovereignty. Now, we can go to seed on that. And we see um, Calvinism. We've talked about that when we did Romans uh, 8, 9, and 10. Or 10, 9, 10, 11. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, one of the things that can happen is you say, well, God has done it all. He's called you, and you don't have any choice in it, and you are a Christian because of divine sovereignty. Certainly that has an aspect to it. But then on the other side, he says, you make an effort to supplement. You, you do something, and that is human responsibility. Divine sovereignty human responsibility, and so many times in the Christian faith, we fight against those things. Spurgeon, the great English Baptist pastor in the 19th century, always talked about divine sovereignty in a lot of ways, but he also talked about you've got to, you've got to do something. You've got to make a decision, a choice. It's up to you. And so someone said, how do you reconcile divine sovereignty and human responsibility. So, and Spurgeon, who was very wise, he said, oh, 
I never have to reconcile or need to reconcile friends. I agree? I never need, need to reconcile friends. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility are not enemies. They are friends. They are two sides of the same coin. Now, the difficult thing is trying to understand that, but it's not all, it's not all God and it's not all you. It is God and you. God provides, and it's up to us to do something with what God has provided. So, I think it's really important that we understand that we have a responsibility. And Peter is very strong here. Peter, I think I pointed out last week, it's a little like Paul in Philippians when he says, work out your own salvation that God has worked within you. Get, you know, it's in you. You work it out. You've got to do something with it. Make every effort. And when that word effort means zeal, it means a lot of work. It means intentional progress. Make every effort to supplement your faith. Yeah, well, I, I've got that word up there, supplement. I found an interesting word. I was doing some reading in preparing for this. And one of the books I, I read um, gives a little Greek background. Since this is Wednesday night and you guys are so charged and wanting to learn, let me give you a little bit of this, okay? I wish I knew a lot of Greek. I just know a little. I know enough to get me in trouble. But here, let me share this with you. This word, the writer says, this word indicates generous and costly participation. Did you get that? Generous and costly participation. The idea was drawn from Athenian drama festivals. A rich but generous donor called the Corrigos would help fund the production along with the writer and the state. He would try to outdo other donors by paying the expenses of the chorus, including lavish equipment, equipment and training. So the word came to represent generous and costly cooperation. Generous and costly cooperation. So when it's talking about effort, it's talking about really getting involved and sacrificially getting involved. And that's where Peter goes after this. Now again, let's look at it. Make every effort, verse 5 again, for this reason, make every effort to supplement generous and costly participation and cooperation. Supplement what? Your faith. I want you to notice that. That is the beginning of this succession of words that's going to happen. This is the corner piece. This is the place you begin. Now, if you took this out of context and, and uh, compared it to the, a Stoic philosopher, for example, you're going to find some similar things about um, goodness and knowledge and self-control and endurance. And you're going to see similar words, but this is what sets it apart. <clears throat> and it is the word faith. It's where you begin your Christian experience. You are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. And there again is the dynamic combination of divine sovereignty, human responsibility, grace, and faith. And we start there. Our salvation is anchored in a faith of God who provides redemption through Jesus Christ, death on the cross, resurrection, ascension, and call that's heavenly towards us. And you say, that's where you begin. You don't begin with a discipline and you got to work hard at it. You start at a place that is by grace through faith. All right? Never forget that. The seed of any growth in your spiritual life can only begin with the nurturing of your faith. That's why you never outgrow the need to, to express thankfulness for the grace of God. You never need to get, 
to even grow past what God has done and how blessed you are with the graciousness of God through Jesus Christ. That is the faith, that is the gospel that transforms and continues to transform all of your life. Okay? Very important. So what are we going to <clears throat> make every effort to supplement? Well, the first thing that he says is goodness. Now, it's, again, interesting word. It's the same word, if you go back into the verse, in verse 3, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His, His own glory and goodness. Same word that describes God's moral excellence. Does God ever do anything morally wrong? Of course not. Why does he not do anything morally wrong? Because he is God. He sees everything. He knows right from wrong from the beginning through all eternity. And so he chooses because his divine nature is one of perfection and love and goodness. He always chooses good. He never chooses evil. He is opposed to evil. And this is the description that we have of God. And now, can you imagine... The very first thing that Peter says, now here's what I want you to make an effort to supplement your faith with, generously and, and sacrificially uh, cooperate with God, and that is to be like God in your moral excellence. Whew. Wow, you start off pretty high bar, don't you? He does. He really does. You remember what Jesus said? Don't be like the Pharisees. Be like your father. Right? The Pharisees, they're very moral. But that's not enough. Be like your father. You see, we can't say, well, I'll be a little like him. That doesn't work. We have to continue to, what's that word again? Generous, generously and costly cooperation. That's going to mean we have to constantly, when we have moral choices before us, we cannot just depend on our upbringing. We can't depend upon our own thoughts. You can't depend upon your friend. You have to search and seek out God. How would God handle this situation? What would God do? want me to do that means and i'm not i'm talking about moral situations right and wrong how we treat one another what we think about things in the political sphere even what is right what is wrong that's the moral problem and will we make a mistake we will we absolutely will we will have the wrong thought and the wrong deed even though we've sought things out, and you know what? That becomes a trial and a temptation, and, and something when we fail, we say, I have failed. I blew it, and we go back. See, God does not anticipate that you'll always, that you'll always make the right choice, but he's saying, do your very best to make the right choice. And if you make the wrong choice, you're going to supplement that wrong choice with the right choice. Go back to it. You're going to dismiss your pride. You're going to dismiss your excuses. You're going to say, I was wrong, and this is the way I should have done it. Start off your faith supplementing it with a moral goodness that complements God's moral goodness excellence it's a high bar we'll go on from there and really it complements goodness he says with and with goodness with knowledge now remember i told you i got knowledge up here and the word gnosis gnosis last week i told you there are two words that that peter uses um interchangeably they're both the root word Gnosis, it's epignosis and gnosis. Gnosis, epignosis means intimate 
uh, knowledge of a person. It is, um, it is Adam knowing his wife. It is something very close and intimate. And then the other word is gnosis, which means general knowledge, which informs your wisdom, your, your choices. So he says, to add to your moral goodness, you're going to add knowledge. This is gnosis. This is general understanding of who God is in order to make a decision. Okay? How do you do that? You've got, you've got to pick this thing up and read it. You've got to do Wednesday night Bible studies. You've got to dig into your past and say, what am I doing? Why am I behaving this way? What is wrong with me? It is a knowledge that comes by experience and sometimes by falling down and getting back up. But it, it's, it's knowledge. It is looking into God's word and trying to, to, to carve out the principles of God and applying them to your personal experience. Man, that's a hard thing, isn't it? See, this is not like, okay, you're going to go to, um, to a, a, a class on knowledge, and then you got it. That's, that's not enough. It's not enough to go to seminary. It's not enough to go to Bible college. It's not enough to sit in Sunday school. It is a constant refreshing and learning and digging into God himself. Third thing he says, to knowledge, you're going to supplement it with Self-control. Self-control. Remember, if you uh, watched the sermon on Sunday, that, that was the second part of Paul's sermon to Felix. Self-control. Why is that important? Well, again, you could pull this out and pull it into a, put it into a Stoic philosopher, and you would find that self-control was a very important thing. Self-control to Stoic philosophy was you need to deny yourself, deny your feelings, deny your thoughts, and do the right thing. But that's not self-control biblically. Self-control here means that the Spirit of God is in control. If you go back to the um, fruit of the Spirit, you'll find self-control is right in the middle of that thing. But it's talking about that's because of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not simply, I am going to make myself disciplined and do these things, but rather the Spirit of God is in control of your life. Why? Because of the choices you're making your goodness, the knowledge that you're understanding of God, and it is, it is releasing the power of the Holy Spirit more and more in your life to change your life, and you're experiencing self-control. Now, self-control you're going to add to that endurance. And that's very interesting. To me, that's very interesting. Why? Because self-control only works as long as you are self-controlled. Let's talk about January. Let's talk about diets. Let's talk about goals that you've set. You know, it is so good to set goals. And I think it's one of the things he's saying here. You, you, need to, you need to really work hard at this. You need to supplement this thing. You need to make some choices and some high bars. And that's going to be great. So self-control, I'm going to do this. I'm going to behave this way. I'm going to watch these things. I'm going to spend time in God's word. I'm going to, I'm going to pray more effectively. I'm going to do these things. And that is so great. That's a great choice of self-control. It's, it's going to come out of generous and costly cooperation. It's really good. And it's only as good as long as it lasts. Been on, I've been on a number of diets in my life. I still watch what I eat all the time. And it works really good until someone sends me some cookies. And then my endurance takes a back seat. See, we will only grow in these areas as much as we endure. 
Now, that's on the one end. On the other end is when we experience the negatives of life, and they derail our, our ambitions and our desires and our knowledge and our goodness and self-control, right? Because we're, dis we're dis despondent, discouraged, uh, unhappy, struggling. So Peter is saying, look, you've got a, you've got a supplement. You've got, how's that going to happen? Well, you, you've got to supplement it with a generous and costly cooperation. you got to work at it, guys. That's what Peter's saying. It's not going to happen by itself. Endurance, you don't fall off a table and all of a sudden you're, you're enduring something. It is working hard at it. This morning, I, I give you an example. I made a, a commitment. You know, I, I've run a good part of my adult life, but in these last months when it's gotten cold uh, and, and we've been stuck inside and, and then it gets hot and so I don't run. I use elliptical. Now, I've got a nice machine. It works well, but it's not running. It's not like running outside. I don't, I don't, you know, it's not as hard on you. So I made a commitment. I'm going to run <clears throat> two to three times every week, every other day. Unless it's cold. And this morning I got up about 6.30. I looked. Oh, it's 48 degrees. I got to do it. It's not cold enough to make an excuse. And so I had to endure my choice. And I went outside and ran. And I'm so glad I did. But you've got to get past that unwillingness to do what you said you were going to do. Endurance. Well, to endurance, you have godliness. Godliness means living a life before God that is, and I mean this in a good way, pious, that reflects who God is in your life. You do that before God and you do it before others. There's no place for pride and self-righteousness. Why? Because you know that it is by grace through faith, you not of yourselves. You know that. There's no boasting with God. So it is not as Oh, see how holy I am today. Don't you wish you were as holy as me? No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Godliness is living a life of utter humility and, and awesome love before God, before others. And then he, he goes on. Those are all kinds of things with... Uh, that is our relationship with God. Then he, the last two is our relationship with others. Godliness is a great kind of bridge into those last things. What are they? Let's say of knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, and now brotherly affection. The Greek is phileo, phileo, rather, phileo, brotherly love. And this is probably, probably what he's talking about is <clears throat> Peter talking about the love of the Christians for fellow Christians, your brothers, your sisters in Christ. Why does he say to love them? Because they're people. And just because they're Christians doesn't mean they're easy to love. So he's saying you've got to supplement your faith with brotherly love. That means you've got to love them. Well, I don't want to love them. You've got to love them. Why? Because God said so. Because your faith will not be supplemented. You will not grow as a believer unless you are purposely, willingly showing love for the brothers and sisters that are in Christ. But not only that, and this is the end of it, right? He started off supplementing your faith with goodness and ends it with love. See if I can find it here real quick. I'm, I'm about, about finished with verse 7. Godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Phileo is brotherly affection. And then you know what the other one word, word is, agape. This is the God kind of love. This is the unconditional love. Who's it for? It's for everybody, folks. 
For God so agape the world. And so what should you do? So you, fellow believers, should agape the world. How are you going to do that? You've got to supplement. You've got to work at it. It's not something that that's just, oh, it's so easy for me to love the world. Are you kidding? This is hard to love this old, uh, evil, angry, desolate world. I mean, it's desperate times. And so easy for us to become critical, angry, judgmental. Oh, I'd never do that. And he says, he says, no, no, that's not agape, folks. You know what uh, it means to uh, supplement? It, oh, you, maybe you haven't heard me say it. It means to generously and costly cooperate, give over. And especially when it comes to agape love. And you know how we do that? We go all the way back to our faith. It runs us back to our faith and says we need to keep going deeper into our faith and recognize the depth of God's love for us and humanity. When we were all sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And by the way, that's you. That's me. Whoa. That's the appeal. He is saying, come on, guys. Make every effort. Make every effort. You've got to put it in to practice. You can't just sit there and not say, I'll wait till God blesses me real good, then I'll bless somebody. No, you bless somebody because you have recognized that you've been blessed by God. God loves you that much. Look at verse 3 and 4 again. I'm not going to read them again. Look at them. He's given us everything that's required for us to live a godly life. He's worked it in. Now you've got to work it out. Make every effort. Let's look at the bottom here. And that talk about the appeal, the aim. What's the aim here? Well, look at verse 8 and 9. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that means you're keeping supplementing it. It's continuing to grow. You're a growing believer. They will keep you from being useless <laughs> or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted, and has forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. Look at verse 8. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, go back and look at that list. Go back and look at the list. Say, well, I'm pretty good on the, on the knowledge. I really study hard. And endurance, yeah, I'm, I'm hanging in there. I, I'd give me about an A minus. The rest of them, maybe, maybe C plus, B minus. That's not what it's about. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. It's not a, a cafeteria style. He's saying each one of these needs to grow in and through and with the other. It's not saying, I'm better at this. than It may be that you're naturally disposed that way, but he is saying, you have to supplement. Did you get that? And then he says, if you possess these, if you're supplementing, if you're working at it, in increasing measure, how are you? This is 2021 compared to 2020 this time last year. How about five years ago? How about 10 years ago? Any change? Any growth? Any deepening interest? Any graciousness in your life that wasn't there? Patience? Joy? Self-control? It's increasing. And he says... If you have an increasing measure, what will it do? It will be a barrier to you from becoming useless and unfruitful. The word useless, I, I found out, was only used about three times in the, in the New Testament. Jesus uses it in Matthew, forget the chapter, Matthew, when he talks about the idle servants that are doing nothing. Useless. You ever had somebody say, you are absolutely useless. There are a lot of things that I'm absolutely useless in. 
But displaying the love of God in my life should never be one that we're exempt from. And unfruitful. That's exactly what the word means. It means there is no fruit bearing in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I think I left one out, but it's, it's what, and, and then it should be, why do we have those things? Because he's placed in you and you work out your salvation by goodness and knowledge and self-control and endurance and godliness and brotherly affection and love. You're supplementing, you're generously, consistently, and costly adding to that. And if that's the case, your life will bear fruit. The only way that you know what that tree is, is not by looking at the bark, but by looking at what it grows. And if you are in Christ, you should grow the fruit that resembles Jesus Christ. And then he says, the person who, who is the opposite of this, now notice, if you have these things, or if you don't have these things, he's not saying it's a mixture. He said, you're either progressing or you're regressing. It's one of the two. You're not just staying status quo. You're not just a Christian, and I've been that way forever and ever and ever. No, he said, you're either progressing or you're regressing. If you don't have these things, then you are blind and short-sighted and have forgotten the cleansing of his past sins. The way that is written sounds a little confusing. I like what I saw one person doing, saying that short-sighted or nearsighted complements blindness. It is, it's kind of like me. If I take my glasses off, I can see objects, but I will tell you what, they would not allow me to drive and nor would I want to because I'm nearly blind. When, it, when I take the corrective lenses away, I, I may be able to see stuff, but I'm blind. I cannot tell if there's cars coming down the road. I cannot see things. I'm nearsighted and without correction, I'm blind. Another, another writer said it's like closing your eyes and, and making yourself blind. But Peter is saying, you, if you don't have these things, if you're not progressing in your, in your sanctification, in your growth, you're not becoming more and more like Jesus Christ then there's a blindness that's setting in because you're not seeing the big picture. Why are you not seeing the big picture? Because you have forgotten. You have forgotten the cleansing of your past sins. Too many people said, I was saved 40 years ago, and I'm still saved today. I haven't changed a whit, but I know I'm going... You've forgotten. You've forgotten what it cost. And it's never affected you and impacted you. In fact, go back up to verse 8. I meant to say one thing, that they will keep you from being useless and, or unfruitful in the knowledge. Remember I said earlier, this word here earlier was gnosis, which means wisdom, practical understanding, practical knowledge that leads to wisdom. But here is the other word, epignosis, the intimate knowledge. And you've forgotten the in, intimate knowledge, the intimate relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. Let's end it up with three, these three thoughts. It's a reminder. Reminder here, these verses from 5 to 9 is a reminder that they're based upon verses 3 and 4. They are working out of a worked-in salvation. Number, number two, now, there's a challenge. The challenge is to nurture these things continuously and ongoing. You don't just say, I'll take one and I'll, I'll leave the other, but rather there is, a, there is a formation that's happening in your life. And each of these things are, are developing and you have to nurture it. That's the challenge. I, I taught voice for many years before I went into ministry. And I had a lot of good students, and I had a, a lot of students that were good, but never turned out very well. And it was one thing that, that, that uh, separated them. It wasn't always their talent, but it was their willingness to work. 
Because I would give them an assignment. I would teach them how to open their throat and do the voice things and what to do with it and how to sing the song. And I would, I would assign that song and say, now you need to work a, an hour or two every day on this. And the good ones would work on that, come back, and they would work through problems, and they got better and better and better. But I would have many students who just couldn't find the time to really put into practice what I had told them to do. Do you know what? They stayed about the same level the entire year. They didn't change. Because if you don't work at it singing, you're not going to improve. And if you don't work as a Christian and nurture these things and supplement these things with generous and costly cooperation, you don't grow. You don't change. You become useless and fruitless. It's a challenge. And the last one is caution. Caution. Don't limit these. Well, okay, I got six things here. And that's all I'm going to work on. No, 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 no. You can go over to the fruit of the Spirit. You can go to James. You can go to Romans. You can go all the way through and find all kinds of things. Don't limit the, the expression of the salvation that God has called you to and provided for you. And also, don't legalize it. Don't say, I got more goodness than you. I got more knowledge. I got more self-control. I'm somebody special. Don't legalize it, okay? Don't do that. Now, verse 10 and 11 is really part of this. But I want to take those two verses and, and work, on my, work through them with you next week. So we're going to end there. And I think that's, that's enough for you. It's enough for me. And I, I love this passage. Read, just read this passage over and over again and begin asking yourself questions. Am I expressing the goodness of God? Am I digging deep into the knowledge of God? A am, I, am I showing self-control? Is there fruit in my life? Am I growing in the Spirit of God? At, what kind of effort am I making that is generous and costly that it will supplement the faith that God has given to me. Grow, grow, grow. That's the challenge. Thanks for watching. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.